session recorded. It's going to tell you that it's recording. So if you are scared to death, I apologize. Welcome to our session, Sounds Like a Plan. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about lesson planning and unit design using Grant Wiggins and Jay McTie's Understanding by Design, which is commonly known as backward planning. And I got to tell you a little bit about my history as a planner and how I came to know about Understanding by Design. I came to know about it through the biggest failure in my teaching career. And I started teaching in 1994. I'm in my 28th year in the classroom. And so in 1994, I came in as a brand new teacher. I ordered, I, I came into a school that was getting ready to adopt new textbooks. So I ordered the same textbooks that I had used in my high school classroom. When I moved on to, I left that school after about seven years and I was moving into another school that was adopting new textbooks. And when I had the opportunity to adopt those new textbooks, they were moving on. Uh, there was a, a new version of that textbooks, textbook series called Realidades. So I adopted Realidades because that was now the new version of the same textbook that I had known from high school. It was all very comfortable to me. It was how I had learned to speak Spanish and I had been successful in learning to speak Spanish that way. And so that was my comfort zone remaining between the covers of the textbook. It told me where to start and where to finish. And if I didn't get through Realidade 7B by the end of the school year, I didn't feel like I had covered enough material. And then in 2004, 2005 school year, a friend of mine had convinced me to do the national board certification process. And so we started this national board certification together. And she abandoned me. She bailed on national board and I went on on my own <laughs> and I completed the process. And when I got my scores back, I did not achieve national board. Now, they always tell you, I don't know if any of you have done national board certification, but they always tell you when you do national board certification that approximately 50% of people do not pass on their first time. And I don't know if they still tell people that, but when I did this in 2004, 2005 school year, they told people that 50% of people don't pass on the first time through. But I thought to myself, you know, in our area, there are a lot of districts that are paying for their teachers to all do it. And so this is probably teachers that aren't taking it very seriously or like, you know, their school is paying for it. And I've really worked hard on this. And, you know, I know an index card game for every verb conjugation that there is out there. Like I am dominating these uh, dice games and like I have this down. So when I got those scores, I felt like the wind was totally sucked out of my sails because my lowest two scores, and I'm not talking about like marginally lower, my lowest two scores out of four points, it was on a four point scale. Uh, my lowest two scores were a 1.25 and a one out of four, a 1.25 on designing instruction over time and a one on knowledge of how language acquisition works. So it told me that I had no idea how students acquired language and that I had no idea how to plan for their learning. And when I sat down and looked at the units that I had, so the unit that I had presented in my national board portfolio was a unit directly from my textbook. And I wrote my entire paper about a textbook unit from page one to page whatever of the textbook unit. And when I took the testing on knowledge of language acquisition, I didn't know, I only knew one of the four terms that they gave me. And when I went back after I left the testing center, I knew I hadn't done well on that test because I knew I only knew one of the four terms. And so I looked them up when I got home because that was before like cell phones. I did this in 2004, 2005. Like I had to drive home and get on my computer and get on Google with the modem 
and like type it in there. Uh, I had to look up these terms and I found out that these were terms that were things that Stephen Krashen had proposed, like the input hypothesis and the monitor hypothesis. And they were things that I had never heard of before. And so I started to research them and I realized that there was a whole different way to look at learning language. And so it set me on a path to learn about different ways that students could learn language. So all that to say that I started exploring other possibilities for ways that my students could learn to speak Spanish. And so I started planning differently. I went back to get my master's. I got my national board certification the next year. I redid the unit that I presented. I only redid one section. I, I had scored high enough in the other categories that I only needed to redo one section. So I redid the one uh, that I had poorly planned the unit. And this time I didn't use a textbook based unit. I actually planned a unit from end to beginning on my own. And I thought about it from the terms of national board, like how am I going to plan this unit so that my students can be successful with it? Because I wasn't really thinking about them. I was leaving a lot of students behind. The textbook unit was really at the end of Spanish one, I would start with a hundred kids and at midterm about 25 would drop and by the end of the first year, only about 60 would move on to Spanish too, because they felt like they couldn't do it because I was asking them to spell everything correctly and get every accent correct and to fill in all the verb charts. And it was just a lot of things that they were not capable of quite yet. So I started planning a little differently. So now I go on to get my master's degree and I take one of my first classes was on understanding by design and Wiggins and McTie talk about how it's very hard for someone when you look at things in their component parts, it's hard for someone to put them all back together. And so it's easier if someone looks at everything as a whole. And so I thought that's kind of what I've been missing with my language. How can I help them see the language as a whole in my units? So, and they say, you really have to think about your unit from the end instead of from the beginning. And I never did that. The textbook, I opened up to page one and then I ran all the way through the chapter and then I would pull out the test and give it to the kids. I never looked at the test before I started the chapter, but now I have to think about that differently. So how does your unit flow? Do you start with the test and then figure out how am I going to give them all the input they need to be successful on this test? Or do you teach the whole unit and then go, oh, here's what I'm supposed to give for the test at the end. So understanding by design, I'm just going to give you a brief rundown of what Wiggins and McTie designed for understanding by design. They tell you that you should first identify what your desired results are. What do you want your students to be able to do at the end of this unit? After you know in your mind, what are what is success going to look like to you? Like in your mind, what will success look like? Then you have to plan the assessment. You can't plan any of the instructional materials until you know what the assessment is going to be. Then you plan the instructional materials because if you know what the assessment is going to be like, then you know what instructional materials will help students be really successful on that assessment? I lost my, there he is, I lost my cursor, I couldn't advance. But understanding by design has three different umbrellas. You can plan backward from one unit or you can plan backward from one whole level of language class. You could plan backward from Spanish one, like what's your end result? At the end of Spanish one, what do you want your students to be able to do when they finish your level one class? Do you want them to be able to talk about themselves and their family and their friends? Then what are the kinds of units that you need to teach during level one that would help them be able to do that? So you can have a whole understanding by designed plan curriculum based on a whole level of language class or your whole entire curriculum, your whole language program could be planned through understanding by design. 
So in the chat, the hardest part of thinking about these lessons is we all have so much stuff to cover. Where do we fit in? So I'm going to ask you to think today about a unit you'd love to teach. I'm going to teach you some understanding by design tips and tricks, and I'm going to encourage you to think about a unit that you could create, or even if you love this unit that I show you, if you want to adopt this unit into your curriculum, I'd love for you to take this one and use it in your curriculum. But first, all of us have a really full curriculum. So where do you put it? Like, how do we fit these things in? How do we find room in our curriculum to do something when we already feel really full? So if you think of what you teach right now, if you could just eliminate one thing that you teach, what would you eliminate? Like you could ditch something on your syllabus, something on your scope and sequence that you hate. When you think about it, you go, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to teach it. What would you get rid of? I'm opening this chat so I can see them come in. Don't let me down. Give me some good stuff. Chores. Yes, I threw that one right. I'm going to show you where we're going to put them in just a minute. Yes to chores. Daily routines and chores, jewelry and random stores. Yes. Travel, <laughs> going through customs. Excellent. Anybody else have one? Subjunctive, yes. Like the whole going through the whole process of teaching all the verb charts, the double object pronouns, their little eyes just get glossy and glazed over when you're trying to teach all those lessons. Celebrations, yes. I remember even at the beginning of the year in Spanish one, they come in so excited to learn Spanish. And then you're like, okay, now you talk to them and you do the little mock conversations in the book. And then you're like, okay, now turn to page five and let's do these grammar lessons. So, oh, Dylan, I thought I set it up so both of us could see the chat. Oh, sorry. Okay, just me, only I can see the chat. Okay, well, I have the chat pulled up, so. If you have a question midway, you can send it to Dylan and he'll answer you. All right, next question. What is something that you've always wanted to do with your students? Something you've always wanted to teach them, but you've just felt like you've never had time for? Maybe a unit that you've wanted to teach or like a reader or... Um, a topic that you've thought about, but you haven't been able to make room for. Oh, nice thought you're going to like today. <laughs> Poetry, a novel, more readers. Yes. FVR, SSR, reading novels with novice and intermediates. Novels, lots of Yes, reading is a big one. And hopefully we can talk about how to make room for that to colonial Latin American history and lit. Yes, more cultural stuff. Yes. My, cult my culture and country. I'm from Peru. Yes. So it all starts with the chuck it bucket. So this is, I'd like to introduce you to the chuck it bucket right here. I want you to think about the chuck it bucket as your best friend. And so the chuck it bucket is where we're going to put all of the stuff that is extra and kind of weighing us down. And it can be used for as small of things or as big of things as you want to. So I know that a lot of you are going to be tied to department curriculum. If you're in a department that has a text, you have to stick with what your department is doing. You may be in a department that is doing department finals. You have to cover a set curriculum, but just because they're covering every chapter in the textbook 
doesn't necessarily mean the kids have to know all 175 nouns that are on that vocabulary list about the clothing. If you trim down the vocab list from 175 nouns about pantyhose and whatever, you could take out some keywords that you know the students will remember and that will be engaging and memorable for them. And you can really focus on those. And that actually will help your students perform better on that exam at the end. Like they'll, they'll remember and be able to speak better about those terms. Uh, they'll be able to use them in context better than having all that other stuff weighing them down trying to remember it. Uh, they can write about what they're wearing better and in more detail if they have a smaller amount to try and remember. And then you can focus more of your energy on throwing in something else. So if you can pare down where you can and throw stuff in the chuck it bucket, if you have a little more freedom, I would suggest trying to find like a whole unit that you can take out and throw in the chuck it bucket. If you think you could get away with it, throw the whole chores unit in the chuck it bucket. Really, kids don't do them much anymore. Most of my students are like, I crush the cans. That's it. That's all you have to do at home is crush the can. Yeah, that's all I have to do. So throw those straight in the chuck it bucket. And then that leaves you. I did the chores unit when I was teaching that. It was a two and a half week unit out of my school year. And now I can teach a reader in two and a half weeks. And I feel like I get so much more in a reader unit than I did in the chores unit. And so in the reader unit, teach the reader unit and ask a couple of questions like, hey, do you think the main character has to wash the dishes at his house? I mean, you know, throw a couple chores in there, ask a couple questions about it, you, you know, get some vocab in there, ask them questions about the vocab, act like you're doing the chores unit alongside it. One of the things that helped me get my mind around that idea that the chuck it bucket was okay was when I was in the class on understanding by design, this was one of the graphs that was in the book. And Wiggins and McTie talked about basically with understanding by design students, you know, we have real estate in their brain and their brain has some kind of breakdown here. They have a spot for enduring understandings, the things they're really going to take away from our classroom. And then we have a little space in their brain that's going to be things that are important to know and to do. And then we're going to have a little space in there that are things that are worth being familiar with. And I, I had my focus all wrong at the beginning. When I was teaching from rally.ace, I feel like my focus in the classroom, I was dedicating all my time in the classroom. I was basically teaching in English. I mean, I was definitely about 90%, 85 to 90% in English because I was teaching so many conjugations and so many um, vocabulary words. And we were just doing so many things that they didn't have the comprehension to be able to do in Spanish. I spent way too much time in English. M the enduring understanding I think they came away with was that they, they could chop when we did these chants like, oh, us, ah, um, or uh, a, as, te, e, or whatever. Like we did all these chants of verb endings and they would chop when there was an accent and they would pound the desk when there wasn't an accent and they would use two hands when it was plural and uh, one hand when it was singular. And uh, I mean, it just, that, that was what they took away as the most important thing from my classroom. And since I stepped away from that, I realized that's important to know and do. Like it is important that they know it was, I was, you were, you know, there was like, there are some very important verb and grammatical structures that they be able to know and use because otherwise they can't communicate with people. But the enduring understandings that I want them to take away, my students are from rural Southern Illinois. So they need to take away things like people around the world speak this language and I want to be a global citizen. I want to speak this language. I want to, you know, I'm, I'm sending them out to be our future doctors and lawyers and police officers and politicians. Like I want them to have a positive view of the people of the world, like the global majority. I want them to go out 
speaking a second language, feeling positively about their experience. And I wasn't giving them that before when so many kids were failing, when so many kids were coming away going, I can't spell in Spanish. I can't conjugate verbs. I I suck at Spanish. When they were coming away with that attitude, what I was sending out into the world was a bunch of people that said, you know, it's hard to learn a language. I can't learn a language. I'm terrible at learning a language. I'm, you know, I can't speak Spanish. And so they carried around this chip on their shoulder about Spanish. And that's not who I want to leave my community. I want to send out ambassadors. I want to send out kids that are very positive, that want to travel, that want to communicate with others, that want to cultivate relationships, that want to, that want to go on in their language education. And so the enduring understandings now are cultural and are like, these, you know, these rich interactions with people from around the world. So we have guest speakers and we have, you know, we, we visit virtually other places and we, we study the sustainable development goals and we look at our roles as global citizens. And so now, now I've kind of flip-flopped what, what I want them to take away. And it's made a difference. Our enrollments are so much better now that we're looking at language in a different way. So it's not that it isn't important to be able to communicate because I want them to be able to communicate. Some of those other things, it is worth being familiar with spellings and stuff, but it isn't as important to know and do as I thought it was. And it's definitely not the enduring understanding that I want them to take away like I thought it was before. So all of those things, all of those things, have changed. So that's where the chucka bucket comes in. Some of the old things from before went in the chucka bucket and they start to accumulate in there and it makes more space in my curriculum to do the things that I want to do. Dylan, do you want to um, answer the qu- Like, why don't you pop in? Tell me what the question was and tell the answer. Oh, sorry. I dropped No, it. no, perfect. <laughs> All right. So Sarah had asked um, a question saying, what do you do when students want to go beyond the sheltered vocab or ask you for is that aren't necessarily on the trim version of what your, what your unit is? So for me, I said, when that happens, I, I'll sometimes let them know the word, but I also show them, I like encourage them to go to word reference and show them, you know, how words can be used because I think when they take that ownership over their Um, over their own education, they're more likely to remember those terms that they look up also. And I'm going to show you something I think you'll like about that too, Sarah, on the unit that we're going to talk about today. Um, Because I'm with Dylan. I think when they get that ownership over the words, I think that they, I see them more in their writing than any of the words that I suggest for them when they have chosen, when it's a self-selected word, they go crazy on those. Or if I tell them, oh, this word is too advanced for you, then they're like, oh, no, it's not. I'm going to use that one. <laughs> so let me tell you a little about this unit. I uh, I love making units from little weird stuff I find down rabbit holes. And uh, just about the time COVID hit, this video popped up on YouTube, and it's called Bajo la Mesa, or Under the Table, if you're a French teacher. Um, this unit is in Spanish. I put it in the in the folder anyway. So even if you're a French teacher, you won't be able to directly use this unit, but hopefully it will give you ideas for what you might be able to do if there's a music video or a resource similar um, that you could take and create something like this from it. So in this music video, the, the group had visited an art gallery. Now, I love the video. In the video, the, the, the musical group goes into the art gallery and there's a man and he's drawing these two characters and the characters come to life out of his art book and they jump into and out of a variety of different paintings. And as they go through the different paintings, we see that they're paintings by famous artists. And so my mind goes, ah, art unit. And so I think, yay, this is the kind of unit that I need for my students because one of my goals in level three, as so Spanish two moving into level three is basically just glorified level two, right? Because they are just stepping out of level two. So they are 
you know, according to what Actful says, you know, they're, they're glorified novice highs, you know, they're stepping in, into intermediate low in, in things that they are familiar with, but whenever they start over with a new unit, they're still just, you know, fancy novice highs. And so I'm thinking, you know, what we need to do here, I don't teach AP. My school is a dual credit school. And so we already have college credit, eight semester hours through our community college. So we don't do AP, but I know that the AP themes are important themes and the AP themes align really well with the sustainable development goals. And I figure even though my students aren't taking the AP exam, my students are taking the Apple or the stamp test at the end of their four years to try and earn the state seal of biliteracy. So I still want to gear my students toward those AP themes because I want them to be successful on their testing after year four so that they can try and earn that state seal by literacy. Because in Illinois, the bar is set very high. It's at intermediate five or intermediate high. Um, so our students basically with that intermediate five, uh, it's a four or a five on the AP. So they have to perform very high. Um, on that after four, I, we have a four year program. So after four years of Spanish, they have to score that four or five on the AP or intermediate five on the Apple or a seven, I believe on the stamp uh, to, to get that uh, state seal by literacy. So my goals in this unit to get that score in their writing, one of the things you have to do to be a high intermediate is to really be descriptive in your writing. So we have to start somewhere. So this is where we're gonna start. We're coming into our first unit of Spanish three. So our goal here is I'm gonna get them started looking for details in something. So what a better way to get somebody looking for details than artwork, right? So I see this video and I think that's a great goal. With this video, I could have my goal be to build skill at comparing and contrasting artworks and at finding tons of detail, like really describing something in detail. So that's my goal. I have to identify what my goal is first to backward design. Then I have to know how I'm going to assess the students. So according to backward design, I can't plan any of my unit until I know what my assessment is. So I think to myself, okay, how am I going to assess them? And then I think, okay, I need, I need an assessment, a task that's going to let them show what they know in a way that makes them feel comfortable. And I'm all about student choice and voice. And I have, I have a wide array of student preferences and some of mine prefer to write, but I do have some that prefer to speak. And so on this particular assessment, I told them they could write or they could speak about their painting. So they're going to pick one of the paint. I, I actually, uh, this year I amped it up a little. I told them that they could, for the solid A, they could talk about the paintings that we had in class. For the A plus, like for an extra credit point, they could talk about a painting we didn't discuss in class. And I had some students that did that and did a really great job. So I wanted them to answer this question. Why are you interested in this painting? What do you see in the painting? So they had to get really detailed about what was in the painting. How do you feel when you're looking at the painting? So they really have to describe their emotions when they're looking at it. And then they had to compare the painting with another painting they knew. So again, they could compare it with one of the other ones we talked about in class or they could compare it with another one that they had never seen in class before, which made them really have to stretch because the ones in class we've already discussed in detail and the ones that are coming from outside of class, they have to look at and dig all the details out on their own. But in addition, I kind of wanted them to have a, a fun aspect of it. So uh, they recreated the painting as well. And I, I didn't want, we know that not every student has the same kind of home life. And so I didn't want this to be one of those things where kids with no support at home ended up 
with a lower grade because they couldn't do this part well. So choice one is just be the painting. They just pose as the painting. So to be Mona Lisa, all of my kids have an iPad because we have one-to-one -one iPads at school. So all they had to do was pose like this as Mona Lisa. And we talked about this on day one. Like if you just want to skim by, like go out in your yard and go and pose as Mona Lisa, that's it, you're done. If you really wanna get into this, then you can, like if you're artistic and you wanna go crazy on this assignment and I'll show you some of their finished products later on, um, you can do change the artist's style. So you can go, uh, this is the girl with the pearl earrings. She went for like a more abstract art or you can recreate the painting with household items. And some of the kids just really went crazy doing those and they were so great. And so they, they brought their recreated paintings and they used those then as they spoke or as they wrote to talk about the paintings. So now I know what my goal is and that is to get them talking in detail. And I know what my assessment is and that is that they're going to compare and contrast two paintings by using a lot of details to talk about the two paintings. But now I have to break this unit down. What's my vocabulary? What's my grammar? What's my cultural element? What kinds of readings are we going to do? And then I already know my assessment, but I need to make sure the kids know what their assessment is going to be as well. So Sarah was asking about vocabulary. This is basically what I do. I give them a vocabulary list and it has the key words that we're going to use. And some of them like V, we have used the word V before I saw, but I know that they're going to need this in this unit. And so I just throw it on there so that it's a reminder. The I form <laughs> is B. Uh, this is what it looks like. Don't forget to use it this way. It's not veo. It's not vo. It's not, you know, like just to make sure that they're using the right thing. Um, they know me interesa from before, but just to make sure they use it, they know me siento from before. And then I give them all these blanks. As we go through the unit, when we come up to things they'd like to know, they have some spaces. And I'm like, guys, the spaces are for you to put down words that you'd like to add, words that add value to this unit for you. I want you to put words in there that you'd like to talk about the art in more detail, words that describe the painting you're interested in. And the more of those words that you fill in, the better. You could even have them turn in. Um, we do a lot of formative assessments before the summative. So this is like, give them a five point formative assessment for having this vocab list and keeping it during the, during the unit. And if they add some extra words to it, uh, give them a plus one for adding some extra vocabulary during the, you know, just to keep them looking back to this vocabulary list and to keep them thinking of words and adding them on uh, as you go along um, or give them, you know, just it's a way to have them looking back at the vocab all along. Then the grammar bubble. The grammar bubble is in all of our units from somewhere to share. And it's just a reminder to me and to anybody that uses any of our units. I try to, every unit that I sit down, I try to remind myself, our students, one of the things that shocked me the most when I went to my first OPI, uh, I went to a workshop on what the OPI, Actful's OPI exam. I went to my first workshop on what they do when they rate the OPI. To get an advanced low on the OPI, you have to be confident and comfortable in the present, past, and future tense. They aren't looking for all the fancy tenses. They are literally looking for students to be able, like when they're rating those, when they're listening to those college kids who are just graduating after their fourth year of college, they're giving them scenarios that are asking them questions that are trying to manipulate out of them the present, past, and future tenses. They're, they're trying to throw them into well, what will you do after you get out of college? Well, 
uh, what did, what did you do, uh, on, you know, your fourth birthday, you know, they're, they're trying to put them, give them a complication. Uh, what happened whenever you couldn't get the tire off your car? So they're, they're trying to get them to use the past, present and future in the right time. Like when they are asked a question in the past that they respond with the past. And it, it doesn't have anything to do with the subjunctive or the conditional or the command forms are all the things we use the present tense in Spanish one, and we use the past in Spanish two, and we use the future and the conditional and the subjunctive in Spanish three. And then in Spanish four, we open a hose or a, a fire hydrant, and we just start pouring tenses into their mouths as hard as we can. And all of a sudden, other than the very cream of the crop, the kids totally lose sight of what all these verb forms are. And really to be an advanced low, they just have to successfully be able to manage the present, the past and the future. And so what I try to remember is that I have to start at Spanish one. Everything that I do in Spanish one, I need to give them lots of present tense but I also need to ask them some questions like, did Brandon go to the store? Did, did you eat that sandwich at lunch? And just get, let, get it in their ear. I don't want to give them conjugations. I don't want to give them verb charts. I don't want to I don't want to drown them in a bunch of verb forms. I just want them to start seeing and hearing verb forms in present, past, and future from Spanish one through Spanish four. So that by the time they get to Spanish four, they are comfortable and confident when they hear all of those forms that they know what they mean. Um, so future tense in Spanish one, we make predictions. Is she going to? do you think the girl is going to eat this? Or do you think the girl is not going to eat this? We watch a ton of little short videos and we make predictions about them. Is this boy going to open the present or is he not going to open the present? And so all through the four years where we are really, and even on the OPI, a, a student doesn't have to use the future tense. They can use is going to, and that still counts. They don't even have to use the past tense. They can say, Acabo de, I just got there. And that still counts. Like there are so many ways to work around it that still count. So I try to put something in every unit that reminds students of the present tense. Like how can I work the present tense in here? So in this unit, I wanted to discuss the paintings. So every day we look at the painting and we talk about it in the present tense. In this painting, I see this. I see that um, we do a movie talk, like we watch the music video and we talk about what we see in the present tense. I, we actually look at a couple of paintings besides the ones in the video that are my favorites. Uh, we reinforce the past after we watch the video. Uh, the next day in class, we talk a, about a couple of things that happened in it in the past tense. Um, I have a little reader in this unit that has some biographies of the artists, and that's in the past tense. Um, we compare how the students felt about the art the day before with how they feel about this work of art. Um, the future tense, we make some predictions during the video. I'll stop and I'll go, is the guy going to jump? Is the girl going to, um, we also discuss like, do you think art today is going to have an impact on the future? Um, we talk about their plans to visit museums. Like, do you, do you want to go see, or will you go see the Guggenheim? Will you go see the Prado? Will you go see um, the Louvre? Uh, we also, I try to include some of those. It's great to include chunks of all of those other fancy structures, because then when I get them in Spanish for, I can start applying some of the rules and they go click, like all the lights go on because they've heard them so many times. Like we actually in Spanish for, we're working on the perfect tenses this year. And so pass and present perfect. We've been seeing it. We watched the show El Internado Laguna Negra, and we've been seeing the past and present perfect for since the end of Spanish too. And so it's all clicking together now because we've been reading it for three years. And so they're all going, oh, 
I get it. And I didn't even have to teach any charts. Like they just have seen it so long that it's all kind of clicked together in their mind. Um, so I always put myself a note of the different little special chunks, their fancy chunks. I tell them it's their pinky out language, like drinking their tea with their pinky out. So this is an example of one of the paintings. I make myself notes. I am bad about thinking on my feet sometimes. So I do kind of keep a note sheet. So there's my painting. I made myself a list of questions that I could ask to like dig out all the details in the paintings so that if I teach them, my goal at the end is for them to talk about it in detail. So I have to make sure they see all the details in the painting. So there are all my questions that are gonna help them find the details. So after we've talked about this during class and they've seen all the details, then they're ready. They could talk about this painting if they like it or the next day we'll talk about another one. We have five different paintings. And so maybe they'll pick this one. A lot of them like this painting. A lot of them think that girl does not want to be kissed. And so they pick this painting and say, he, <laughs> she does not like this kisses. I don't want that. Um, we do a lot of readings. I take articles from the internet. I can't, because these resources are, um, you know, I can't take copyrighted work. So I take articles off the internet and then I write like summaries of the articles that I found on the internet. And so, you know, I might find two or three different articles and just take little bits and pieces of them. Um, so this one is about why we might want to visit an art museum. Um, we offer them with questions, both in Spanish and in English in this packet. And we are transferring Forming everything this summer. So all of our packets will have questions in both Spanish and English. I like to have them read in Spanish and then answer the comprehension questions in English because I want to know, I'm checking their comprehension. Like, do you understand the reading? So I want the questions to be in English because I want to know, do they understand it? If I put the questions in Spanish, I'm afraid they'll just look at the words in the question and then go find those similar words in Spanish and just copy the sentence from the text that looks like it down to the answer. So I want to see you literally, you know, have to show me that you understood what you read to be able to answer this question. Um, so I often do my comprehension questions. If they're going to be reading the article on their own, I do my comprehension questions in Spanish. But don't forget to use the chuck it bucket. If you're gonna, if you're gonna design a unit, like when I got online, I found all kinds of things I wanted to put into this unit. But you have to be careful not to drown them in too much art and too much detail. As teachers, like we have all kinds of things that we'd love to talk to them about art, but we got to keep it simple because they are still, you know, 16 to 18 year olds. And so their interest in art is still pretty limited. Uh, so, you know digging too deep in all the different artistic styles and movements and centuries and stuff. Uh, we don't want to get way into that. So I tried to keep it light and tried to keep it simple about the museums and, um, and just skim the surface at, but yet still give them an exploration of some artists. So again, we want in a unit, we want to identify the desired results and to do that, I have, and we have these in our Teachers Pay Teachers store. If you are interested in having them in your room, we do have these. Um, Dylan may be able to find the link and pop it into the chat. Um, the These are Actful's proficiency descriptors and I just keep them on the wall of my classroom. Um, I print them out and laminate them. And then it helps the students see where they are right now and where they're going. So at this unit, they're just coming in from Spanish too. So I tell them, you know, you are basically an, a novice high. You've been writing sentences. You've been writing a lot of sentences that kind of sound the same. Uh, your sentences often start and end the same. I want you to be moving to intermediate low where you use some transition words, 
uh, where you're starting to write at paragraph level, you know, where your sentences start with different words, you know, they don't all say, and the dog went to the park, the dog ate food out of his bowl, the dog, like everything doesn't sound like a kindergartner wrote it. I want you to start saying the picture has a man, the picture has yellow. The I want you to start having sentences that blend and flow. So the background has a lot of colors and I see that the foreground has, but also, so uh, how can you make it sound like an intermediate low wrote it? So these are on my wall so that I can always be showing them where they were and where they're going in their language. So that's my desired results. And I try to do that based on what ACTFL says that our students can do. And this, I found this on ACTFL's website. Um, ACTFL says that at the end of two years, our students end at that novice range. So a student that leaves Spanish classrooms after two years has ended basically at that novice high range. But if we can keep them for four years, they get basically to that intermediate low range. Uh, so, and yes, I did say intermediate low, the average, the national average for a student leaving the fourth year. Now that doesn't mean there aren't high flyers. Our students that stay in for AP, they're a different breed of student. Like the kid that goes on to AP, they're, they're a really high flyer. Uh, but the average kid that takes a four-year program really is producing language about at an intermediate low level where they can put together a paragraph, they can use some transition words, but really as far as being able to go out into the work world yet, they're not there yet. Like they couldn't continue on their language study without a teacher yet. Um, they, they're not quite ready to be an independent. After a six year program, they're pretty solidly in the intermediate mid range. And those intermediate mid kids, they are a little more prepared to grow and blossom on their own. But really what the kids that shine are the three through 12s. If you have a program that runs three through 12, those kids tend to score at the intermediate high range after a three through 12 program. And those kids are best prepared to dominate the testing and go on uh, to be able to speak on their own to, um, to be basically, you know, at the beginning of their fluency at a, at a functional fluency level. So you have to have goals in your unit and you have to think about what lens you're looking through. So for me, my lens was really just kind of that cultural lens of the paintings themselves, looking at the paintings and the artists from the cultural view of, you know, these are the artists, these were their, their well, actually, I guess more the historical and cultural, you know, this is the artist, this is their historical biography, um, this is the cultural representation of their work at the time. Um, but you can look at art from a lot of different points of view. You can look at art. Um, I've looked at Picasso's uh, work through the political lens before. Um, you can definitely look at work artworks through an ecological lens. There are a lot of artists right now who are doing works in like plastics who are, you know, using their work to call attention to ecological crises. So uh, this is actually a National Geographic um, graphic that talks about how you plan lessons um, based on what lens you want to look through. And so um, that's another thing to consider in your lesson planning. When you plan your assessment, don't forget to think outside the box a little. Plan it before you begin to teach. Um, don't make it the only assessment, but remember to make those other assessments kind of formative to guide where you're going. I always try to put in little things that are formative assessments to help me see. That was something I didn't do before my national board. And that was why I ended up getting a 1.25 out of five. I was giving them these quizzes that were bringing everybody's grades down really low because I was counting these high stakes quizzes on things 
things that my students just weren't ready to be doing at the time and uh, people weren't doing well on them. And I was just moving on and leaving them in the dust instead of reevaluating what I was not uh, doing quite right at the time. So I wanna show you, I've showed you this assessment, but I wanna show you that you can think outside the box on a lot of different assessments. So if you're really thinking about planning a unit on a, on a topic that you're interested in lesson planning and understanding by design planning, uh, these are some of the paintings that I got this year. I thought they were so cute this year. Uh, this is the girl with the pearl earring. She redid the queen of hearts on a card. I thought that was great. This girl did the Mona Lisa with her cat. She said it was so hard to get her cat to lay there in front of the background. Uh, and the creation of Adam on the scratch paper. I thought that was great. And this one, um, this is one of my girls that has a really hard time at home, but she wanted to do a good job. So she asked the school resource officer if he would pose with her. <laughs> to do her uh, creation of Adam at school. So I just thought, I mean, they just, they really impressed me with the work that they did to get their uh, paintings turned in. And so I was proud of them. Um, I had all kinds of little things turned in from home. I get lots of starry nights with stuff uh, recreated from home. And I love those too. So assessments, one of the units that I do is a rainforest tour. We do, we study the rainforest. We compare the woods in Carla, in uh, Salem, where I teach with the tropical rainforest in Panama. And my friend who lives in Panama takes the kids on a little tour of the rainforest at just like a two minute tour. And then at the end of the unit, they go out to the woods and they give him a tour of the woods and the kid that has the coolest tour of the woods, we send that video to him and he you know, sends back a little comment on the video. So it's like a fun little reward to win the best video of the class. Uh, so that's kind of a, an out of the box type of assessment that you can have at the end of a unit. And plus, it's like an interpersonal kind of thing where they get to connect with this person. Uh, we did a selfie. We read Frida Kahlo after we had done our unit on art and uh, they did a selfie. Frida has all these selfies where she has like her pets and her monkeys and stuff all around her. So they did a selfie and they drew all the stuff that's important to them all around them. And then they just talked to the people in their group about why the stuff around them represented important stuff in their life. It looks like they're all really good artists, but I just put all their pictures. I took a picture and lightened it really light in PowerPoint and printed them out. And so they had an image behind that they were like coloring over. So they're not all like super talented. I mean, they are like, they're talented in their own way. Um, we do a unit on ocean plastics. And so they do like a two minute elevator pitch on why people should use less uh, one single use plastics. And they had to make a little t-shirt to, you know, explain, you know, like a, a slogan to go with their elevator pitch. So that was kind of their, uh, protect the oceans, save the turtles. Um, then you have to plan your instruction. Like, how are you going to get them ready for these things? Cause they can't just do this, that you have to like plan all those little steps in the unit that are going to give them the knowledge that they need to be able to do them. So what's the vocabulary that they'll need and what little grammar chunks are you going to give them so that they can do it without having to really think through, all of the grammar, what's the content that you'll have to provide to them? And um, what authentic pieces can you bring in? Do you know a speaker that could come to the classroom virtually? Or uh, I even, my friend from Panama does a lot of little videos. Like he'll send them a video and my kids will send him back a video. And then I stitch them together and we watch it. So it's kind of like um, a Q&A kind of movie. Um, we do some articles that we read or we, you know, we read things online. Um, we watch AJ plus Espanol has some great videos on YouTube. Uh, Duolingo has great podcasts. We've been starting to add them to some of our way us units uh, from somewhere to share. So there's lots of little pieces that you can add to a unit that bring in some authentic things that up the level a little bit, because we want as your classes grow, you're going to get more and more of those kids that really do hit that national average of intermediate low. 
but that doesn't mean you want to leave the other kids behind. You want to challenge your top ones with those authentic things, but you still want to scaffold up the guys that need the scaffolding. So, so I try to make sure we have a really comprehensible environment that's also sprinkled with these things that are challenging for my really, really super achievers. Um, and that it's all interesting topics. So they're never bored, you know, but they're always things that keep them learning, even when the content, you know, is not, it's not always the most challenging for them, but, you know, there are challenges for them every day. So again, the bit.ly link is bit.ly dot sounds like a plan toast. I'm going to move myself out of the way here if I can find my, I keep losing my little cursor. It runs off the screen and then I don't know where it went. I don't know why I can't find it. I see it. It's like lighting up stuff at the top, but there it is. Now I'm moving me. Okay. Uh, now I'm out of the way and I'm going to stop the recording.